Good morning, folks. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. It is Wednesday morning at 9 a.m., September 14th, 2022. This is our weekly uh, business agenda. We will start with a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Ackerman. Here. Commissioner Bogue. Commissioner Cross. Present. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Oath. Commissioner Robbins. <clears throat> Here. Mr. Chair, you have five out of seven commissioners present. Great. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. Um, good to see our stakeholders that are in attendance. We've got 55 and counting. Um, we have a full agenda this morning. Uh, we start with commissioner comments. Um, this gives commissioners an opportunity to provide everyone, including our fellow commissioners, with opportunities for comment. Um, I do have one comment. Um, we had posted uh, last week an educational session on last Thursday with uh, ourselves and the Well County Commissioners up in Greeley. Um, we had that meeting. Um, that afternoon, um, early evening, we were we learned that the uh, PDC, one of our operating companies that is pursuing a cap, it's called the Guanella cap. It's uh, docket number 210200012. They were having a publicly noticed stakeholder meeting at the rec center in Greeley. And the commissioners, all five, decided that uh, that might be a good opportunity for us to see how a stakeholder meeting is run. Um, all five of us participated. We did not um, you know, ask questions or otherwise seek information. Uh, we just walked around the room. Uh, it was set up in kind of a science fair style and uh, we were all able to sort of see how that process worked. Um, again, it was publicly noticed to more than 6,000 people that have land within the boundaries of the Glenella cap. And um, I wanted to make a record of that. Um, it was kind of a, a last minute decision on our part. Um, and uh, we touched base with our AAGs and they said that that would be fine provided that I as chair uh, made such notice of this this morning. I see that AAG Davenport has joined us. Did you wanna further make any clarifications there, AAG Davenport? Sure, thanks, Chair. The only thing that I, I think I'd also note is that the meeting was public um, as, as required by our rules. So it, it was a public meeting, it just wasn't held by the commission, it was held by the operator. Very good, yep. Okay, um, that was, uh, I think, the sum total of my commissioner comments. Did anyone else have comments? Commissioner Messner? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we had an opportunity last week to um, welcome Director Murphy back um, from her leave. And I, I certainly am excited that she's back. I wanted to just take a second and um, commend interim direct, former interim director Larson for uh, stepping in and, and, and doing a wonderful job um, in Director Murphy's stead uh, over the last few months. I really appreciate the additional work that, that you put in and, and, uh, and the effort that you made. And um, just wanted to take a moment to thank you for that. Thank you very much, Commissioner. You're here. Thank you. Further comments? Okay, seeing no further comments, next on our agenda is a consent agenda. Uh, does anyone have questions with regard to consent agenda? Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve consent agenda? Sorry. Commissioner McGowan? Uh, Chair Robbins, is the AOC on the consent? Okay, thank you. That's next. Sorry, okay. I should have clarified. I'll move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. Motion and a second. Is there further discussion? All those in favor of the consent agenda motion approval signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda carries. Okay, we also have on our agenda a proposed recommended order. A recommended order is approved if we take no action on it. But if anyone has questions on the recommended order, 
now would be the time to lodge said questions. Are there questions in the recommended order? Mr. McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, um, I wanna preface my, my questions by, I, I don't disagree with what has, um, the agreement that staff and the operator came to. I did have some questions about <clears throat> for the operator, you know, what did the operator learn from this? I'm concerned that this maybe is a standard setup for this operator in similar areas and um, want assurances that the operator has looked at whether or not this potentially could happen again or, and or what the operator is doing to prevent that pipe from freezing inside the water vaults. And then um, from a staff perspective and or the operator's perspective, I was looking back at our rules and I, I feel like that tank should have been in within a containment, a container and containment that would catch a, up to 150% of what the largest tank would be able to hold in volume. And so I'm curious to know how that produced water got off site and out of the containment or catchment area. Um, so these are just questions of curiosity for me and kind of assurances that the operator has kind of looked at its setup and making sure that um, they've looked at other sites and making sure this won't happen again. I believe we have uh, attorney Dave Neslin with us, who is the attorney for the operator. We also have Kelly Rosenberg and Steve Araza. So um, perhaps we would recognize Mr. Neslin first, since I think the question is directed to the operator. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner McGowan, for those questions, which I think are very fair uh, questions. Um, at the outset, let me assure you that uh, this particular piping configuration was unique, was not a, a standard configuration. This is not an issue that has been or or will be replicated in other vaults uh, that Keras owns or operates. Now, let me explain. Uh, the vault here is a concrete structure that's 12 feet deep, eight feet wide, about 20 feet long. It contains one produced water line, valves, and a transducer for measuring pipeline pressure. The produced water line runs horizontally through the vault near the bottom of the vault. Um, it was built about 18 years ago by a prior owner and acquired by Keras about five years ago. And it's, it was built in, a, in an unusual situation in a low lying area that periodically fills with stormwater. And so water fills uh, the, the bottom portion of the vault. At some point in time, an eight to 10 foot piece of pipe was extended vertically from the water line at the bottom of the vault to near the top of the vault. And a, stain, a piece of stainless steel tubing was connected to the end of that piping and the transducer was placed at the end of the tubing. So the transducer was up near the top of the vault. Presumably this was done to protect the transducer and prevent it from being damaged when water filled the vault. Um, and again, that was the configuration when Keras acquired it five years ago. Uh, within weeks after the spill occurred in January of 2019, Keras inspected all of the other vaults that are part of this water system which involved hundreds of other sites. Um, no other vault has a similar configuration with the transducer extended up near the top of the vault or the piping system extending up near the top of the vault. All of the other vaults had a standard configuration with the transducer located just off the water line near the bottom of the vault and so well below the area that is potentially at risk of freezing. And this um, audit or review of other sites was reported promptly to the COGCC in Keras's initial answer to the NOAB, <laughs> which was filed, I believe, January 6th of 2020. So the configuration in question is not standard. It was non-standard. 
It was anomalous and it was unique, nor was it designed or constructed by Keras. Um, Keras has remedied this specific situation by removing the valve, the connector pipe, and the transducer from the vault and replacing them with a straight piece of stainless steel water line. So there's no longer uh, a transducer or any additional piping in that vault. Um, and uh, the, the, again, the, the produced water line is at the bottom of the vault below the area that's at risk of freezing. Um, Keras also installed a leak detector in the vault as well. So that uh, the, the, the concern that, that somehow this is a, a, a problem that is um, associated with Keras's construction or, or operation of vaults or may be replicated at other points in Keras's system. Um, Keras has investigated that issue and found that that risk does not occur. This was unique, a unique configuration apparently built to the unusual situation and the risk of um, you know, water filling the bottom of the vault and should not, uh, it has not been replicated elsewhere, has not been required elsewhere in other vaults. Thank you, I, I appreciate the, the, the explanation. I, I think I was also a little perplexed as to, it, it seemed like um, it took a while for the operator to figure out that this had spilled over the containment tank. And so I'm wondering if you could just comment on that too. And we, the operators talk all the time about how someone stops by and we have equipment that catches these things. And so again, my, my concern is just making sure that we're not gonna have a situation like that. It seems like a lot of water spilled over the containment. Commissioner, this was human error um, in this instance. I think Keras overall has a very good record that when spills occur, you know, you approved an, an NOAV for another pipeline spill last year within the last 18 months involving Keras, where the spill lasted less than an hour. I mean, Keras immediately um, I, I identified the spill uh, from the change in pressure and shut in that particular portion of the pipeline. Lasted less than an hour. This lasted a total of five days. It was human error. Keras regrets it very much. Um, you know, uh, I, I would say uh, Keras has done, you know, several things to try to minimize uh, this risk. Um, it pressure tests this portion of the system more frequently than annually. There's an annual pressure testing requirement under the 1100 series rules. Uh, Keras not only pressure tests annually, but more frequently than annually. Keras also has a continuous pressure monitoring system. And again, overall, those systems have worked well. Now you've also asked, why didn't secondary, why, why wasn't there secondary containment that, that caught this spill? And I, I'm sure um, Ms. Rosenberg and Mr. Aruza will, will get to that. I can give you my perspective, um, which would be that the rule you mentioned, which is rule 603 um, O. Um, it requires the secondary containment for storage tanks. And the vault did not contain and was not associated with a storage tank. Um, the vault was simply used to isolate this portion of the produced water flow line and the pressure monitoring gauge and, and associated valves uh, that were part of that flow line. So there was not uh, a storage tank that triggered the requirements of rule 6030. Uh, there are other uh, secondary containment requirements under Rule 608F for buried tanks and vessels that store produced fluids. But again, this vault was not storing produced fluids. Uh, and Rule 608G requires secondary containment or a spill management plan for fluid handling equipment that is not a tank or a flow line. Well, here we have a flow line. So rule 608G didn't apply either. Um, the, this, this was part of a flow line system and flow lines are regulated under the 1100 series rules. Those rules do not have a general secondary uh, containment requirement. They do have many requirements 
to protect the environment. And Chair Robbins and Commissioner Messner were very active in those rulemakings where those requirements were adopted. There's, I think, 25 pages of regulations now that regulate flow lines. Rule 1102 imposes specific requirements for flow line materials, design, installation, cover, maintenance, operations, and so forth. Rule 1103 requires isolation valves so that portions of the line can be shut, shut in promptly. And Rule 1104 requires pressure monitoring and then a integrity management program, again, which in this case involves both annual pressure testing um, throughout the system uh, and a continuous pressure monitoring uh, program where pressures are continually monitored um, and measured. Thanks for clarifying. I think, and again, you know, like I'm still on a learning curve here. When I saw vault, I envisioned a, a container that was stirring liquid and didn't really um, recognize that that was a flow line. So I, I appreciate the explanation. And if staff has anything to add, I'm all good. And I, um, I'm very appreciative of you coming and talking about how the operator has looked carefully at all their other sites and is going to work. Make try to make sure this doesn't happen again. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I don't know that Steph does have anything further to add, um, but I want to give you the opportunity if you do have anything further to add. Great. Um, yeah, a few, I have a few quick additions. First of all, my name is Stephen Arousa. I am uh, the Environmental Protection Specialist uh, for Garfield County, as well as Rio Blanco and Mesa. Um, I wanted to add briefly to uh, what Mr. Neslin had said about the uh, the delay in the occurrence of the spiller release versus when it was ultimately discovered by the operator. I would just add that there was a significant amount of precipitation and stormwater management was a uh, primary concern during that initial response that came when the spill was uh, eventually discovered. But that was something that presented a challenge to uh, visibly at least seeing that something may have been wrong. Uh, fluids accumulating in areas that had previously been saturated with stormwater were pretty difficult to discern, I imagine. Uh, secondly, to the question of secondary containment, uh, I would just add that um, Rule 608, which was referenced by Mr. Neslin, applies to oil and gas facilities, of which uh, pipeline vaults are not considered to be facilities, and that is something that came out of uh, pipeline rulemaking that occurred in response, I believe, to the Firestone incident. I wasn't personally involved in that rulemaking, but uh, I would say that folks that were involved may have recalled a conversation between the agency and operators regarding whether or not to consider those vaults to be facilities. Putting a note in my rule book, thank you. Uh, great questions, great answers, great discussion. Further questions? All right, I'm not seeing any further questions. Um, again, uh, I'm asking AAG Davenport to perhaps appear visually. Um, at this point, we have a recommended order. We've had some questions about it, but I believe that folks are comfortable with it becoming an approved order, which I believe means we just take no further action. Is that accurate? That's correct. We just move on to the next agenda item. All right, going once, going twice, going thrice, we're moving on to the next agenda item. Thank you, uh, staff and Mr. Neslin, for appearing and answering the good questions that we had for you this morning. Okay, uh, moving expeditiously through our docket, we will now take up docket number 2203-00044. It is an OGDP called the Garnet OGDP, and it is uh, by applicant Bayswater Exploration and Production. Um, we have Mr. Priscilla with us. Uh, I do note on our calendar that we were perhaps gonna hear from Mr. Maxey from Well County uh, to start. Um, Ms. Larson, good morning. Um, do we have Mr. Maxey or someone from his department? 
I do not see Mr. Maxey in the meeting. Um, if there is a Weld County representative that would like to provide comments, um, we're happy to elevate them if they could just raise their hand. We'll give them a moment to see if someone does okay. raise their hand. Mr. Prashala, do you know if anyone from Weld County was planning on presenting? I am not aware, but I did see it on the agenda that uh, Mr. Maxey would be providing comment. I think it's just our custom that whenever something's within an incorporated Well County, we, we would very much like to hear from the Well County team. Um, what, what I guess what we can do is we can proceed to your presentation for Bayswater. I see you have several folks, including Mr. Struna with you. Good morning, Mr. Struna, good to see you. Um, and if Well County folks show up, we will recognize them at the appropriate opportunity. I, I will also note uh, for the record, I, I glossed over it, but we did not have anybody sign up for public comment. We also did not have anybody provide any written public comment. So just for the record. So Mr. Prashala, with that, I believe we will recognize you. Excellent, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and good morning, commissioners. Uh, good to see you again. My name is Joe Prashala with Wellborn Sullivan Mech and Tooley. And I am here today on behalf of Bayswater Exploration and Production. Also with me are Lauren Walsh, the landman for Bayswater. She will be handling the, uh, the presentation uh, at that point. Uh, and also we have several representatives of Bayswater uh, that include Steve Struna, President and CEO, Tyler Hammond, District Landman, Robert Carney, the Completions Manager, Jeff Overman, Drilling Manager, Brian Kaminke, production manager, Brad Rogers, EHS manager, and Ann Feldman, a regulatory consultant. And all of those folks will be available to answer questions that you may have uh, at the conclusion of Ms. Walsh's presentation. Uh, we've been here before. Bayswater is a registered operator in good standing with the commission and has satisfied all financial assurance requirements of the state. This OGDP application requests that the commission approve a plan covering approximately 1,213 acres in Township 7 North, Range 66 West, and that's in unincorporated Weld County. The, lo uh, the location is the Garnett 21K pad. That's approximately 13 acres of disturbance, and we're looking to uh, have approval for 24 new horizontal wells on that pad. There is a spacing request, and that is Part one is to modify an existing drilling and spacing unit, uh, which was established by order 4073189. That order established a 960 acre drilling and spacing unit covering the Niobrara and Codell formations, and it had authorized up to 24 wells within the unit. Uh, in relevant part, the modification is to add the Fort Hayes in the Carlisle formations and then to reduce the total number of wells within that unit from 24 to 23. The spacing request also includes a request to have the commission approve a single well wellbore spacing unit. That would be covering approximately 480 acres. And that's for the development of the Niobrara, Fort Hayes, Codell, and Carlisle formations. And that wellbore spacing unit is located along and overlapping the southern end of the uh, drilling and spacing unit that was established by the prior order. Bayswater has secured more than 45% of the leasehold in the DSU in the well water unit, and therefore it has the right to drill and produce in these application lands. The Garnett 21K pad is on fee surface in a rural part of Weld County. Bayswater does have a surface use agreement with the surface owner and has met regarding the siting of the location. The location does meet two criteria under Rule 304B2B. The first is there is a single residential building unit within 2,000 feet of the working pad surface. And the second is that the location was mapped within the boundaries of or immediately upgrading from a mapped visible or field verified wetland. So a alternative location analysis was performed that evaluated five potential alternative locations. None of those sites would have resulted in avoiding all of the rule 304 B2B receptors. With respect to that single RBU within 2000 feet, Bayswater obtained informed consent from both the owner of the building and the tenant who's residing therein. And that satisfies rule 604 B1. 
In addition, Bayswater will employ several BMPs to minimize impacts to that, uh, that single RBU. As to the wetland, uh, while the location was mapped as being within a wetland, it was determined that the wetland no longer exists. Uh, however, there is a, uh, a small wetland approximately 141 feet north and upgrading of the location. However, CPW did provide a waiver to rule 120283 uh, with respect to the storage of uh, chemicals on the location. Also, Bayswater will employ uh, stormwater BMPs for the protection of groundwater and down gradient surface waters. Uh, as noted uh, at the outset by the chair, uh, Weld County is the relevant local government and did approve the Garnet 21K pad at 1041 WOGLA 20-0093. There are no proximate local governments. There are no variance requests. Notice was properly given pursuant to rules 303E and 504 and no petitions or interventions were received. Uh, the director on September 8th, 2022 issued her recommendation, which recommended approval of the application. And uh, Bayswater maintains that the application does satisfy the Conservation Act and all commission rules and respectfully requests that the commissioners adopt the director's recommendation and approve the application. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Walsh and she'll provide you with the overview of the Garnett Oil and Gas Development Plan. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Can you guys see this all right? Is it in presentation mode? It is. It is not in presentation mode. That's odd. Does that look right now? Yep. Excellent. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Lauren Walsh, and I am a senior regulatory specialist and landman at Bayswater Exploration and Production. Today, I'll be presenting our Garnet 21K Pad Oil and Gas Development Plan. I'll take you through several topics today regarding our OGDP, including a company introduction and overview, proposed location with an overview map and alternate location analysis. We will review informed consent, water resources, and then go through a brief permitting timeline, followed by best management practices specific towards air emission reduction and water resource protection. Finally, we will discuss local government partnership and community engagement and wrap up with a summary. To begin, I'd like to go over an introduction to Bayswater, our team, our business values, and our commitment to sustainability. Bayswater was established in 2004. We have a 36-person headquartered office in Denver, Colorado, and a 17-person field office in Eaton, Colorado. We also operate in West Texas and have an eight-person field office in Cahoma, Texas. Our business values include having a long-term business perspective which is evident by the fact that we have been an active DJ driller with a continuous one rig program since June of 2017. We added a second rig in April of 2022, and we'll be adding a second completions crew at the end of this year. We have drilled over 250 DJ horizontal wells. And while we do not plan to plug any wells as part of this OGDP, we have historically plugged 81 of our 97 vertical well inventory. Additionally, we fit into an op option one financial assurance operator designation. We strive to maximize value for Bayswater and the communities in which we operate through operational excellence and strong mutually advantageous business relationships. In fact, the Garnet 21K pad will contribute to beneficial cumulative impacts to the surrounding communities, including royalties paid to local Weld County mineral owners, in contribution to local employment opportunities for individuals and vendors during our pre-production and production phases of operation. Finally, we have a strong commitment to sustainability and believe that the development of oil and natural gas and the stewardship of a sustainable environment are not mutually exclusive. We know that affordable and reliable energy is vital in the US and the world, but that we require a social license to operate. We work hard to gain the trust of communities where we operate and to ensure that our actions always reinforce that trust. 
To kick off a detailed explanation of our proposed location, we've prepared an overview map. The proposed Garnet 21K location is shown as a green star on this map, which is located in Section 21, Township 7 North, Range 66 West, with the proposed access road shown as a yellow dotted line coming north about 1,300 feet from County Road 78. The proposed location is in unincorporated Weld County, outside of any city limits. The red outline here depicts the DSU, and the pink outline shows our WSU. From this location, we will develop or we will develop 24 wells. The four blue stars represent alternate locations considered through Bayswater's planning process. I'll go through each of those quickly now. ALA number one and all potential locations west of our DSU were ultimately ruled out due to the proximity to a disproportionately impacted community. You can see that here in the blue hatching west of our unit. This location also had eight RBUs within 2,000 feet. ALA number two lays in a low area that ended up being within the 0.58 acres of field verified wetland. This location also contained four RBUs within 2,000 feet. ALA number three would require significant rerouting of irrigation ditches from the surface owner and neighbor's properties. And this location had 11 RBUs within 2,000 feet. ALA number four was the site of a previous surface use agreement where we did originally plan to develop these minerals. Initial survey staking and permitting steps were undertaken and afterwards it was determined that the only feasible access was directly adjacent to one RBU, which would have caused substantial dust and noise impacts from trucking of produced water. This location also had seven RBUs within 2000 feet. The proposed Garnet 21K location does have one RBU within 2,000 feet. On this slide, you can see a buffer map of the Garnet location with dotted circles depicting 500, 1,000, and 2,000 foot buffers from our working pad surface. The home within 2,000 feet is shown as a red box, 1,054 feet southwest of our working pad surface. Additionally, you can see that there are multiple uninhabited buildings shown as green boxes within 2,000 feet of our working pad surface, which do not meet COGCC definitions of an RBU. Bayswater has received informed consent from all parties associated with the home, including the homeowner, tenant farmer with a lease to the home, and the current resident of the home. Bayswater based our informed consent letter off of the statewide informed consent template and followed COGCC guidance documents when compiling the enclosures. You can see here that the list of exhibits include drawings, maps, operational plans, informational fact sheets, and finally, the decision page. Next, I would like to discuss the Garnet 21K pad does have an NWI mapped wetland within 500 feet of the working pad surface. These are shown by the blue hatched portion of the map underneath and northeast of the pad. Bayswater hired third-party professionals to perform field wetland delineations of the two areas. The first NWI mapped wetland found underneath the pad was determined not to be a wetland after the field verification. The second NWI mapped wetland northeast of the pad was determined to only have 0.58 acres of marginal wetland in the area due to being used as a man-made pond, irrigation pond, two decades ago. The reduction of the field verified wetland area is not associated with drought. The wetland extent measured in the field reflects on-site conditions that have changed over the course of the last few decades due to different water diversions and storage practices. Because the water was diverted away from the man-made ponds so long ago, hydrology has changed and site conditions began to revert to upland soils and upland vegetation. CPW granted Bayswater a waiver to rule 1202A3 after we demonstrated that our working pad surface will not impact the 0.58 acres of marginal wetland area. We will have primary, secondary, and tertiary containment measures in place to mitigate any risk of spill from staging, refueling, or chemical storage areas. Additionally, the professional wetland scientists findings state that the eight to 10 foot raised berm between the survey area, including the mapped wetland 
and the proposed Garnet 21K pad location, along with the upgradient nature of the survey area from the pad location, effectively ensure that no direct impact of the survey area would be anticipated from construction or operation of the pad location. The planning and permitting process of the Garnet 21K pad has been underway since April of 2019. That's when we began negotiating our original SUA. Some key permitting dates include, in August of 19, we obtained a signed SUA from ALA number four that I discussed earlier. In December of 19, we revisited site selection in accordance with the director's objective criteria. We renegotiated an SUA to a site with less impact to receptors. In April of 2020, an SUA was executed for the proposed location. Please note that in January of 2021, SB 181 rules were implemented. Following that, in April of 21, our 1041 Weld County Wogla final order was issued. In March of 22, our OGDP application was submitted. It was then returned to draft in April of 22, and then in April and June of 22, we submitted our first and second amended OGDP applications per COGCC staff request. In June of 22, we received our completeness determination and mailed our seven-day completeness notice letters. In July of 22, our 30-day public comment period ended where we did receive a number of public comments. Finally, on September 9th, 2022, director recommendation for approval was published. Bayswater prides itself in being best in class and best management practices, some of which we have included here. We will implement ambient sound studies and noise impact assessments for each phase of operations. Lighting will be directed downward and inward and 32 foot high engineered sound and light walls will wrap the perimeter of the location. We will permanently install 16 foot high and 24 foot high engineered sound walls around key production equipment to mitigate noise impacts to the single RBU within 2000 feet. We will utilize a quiet frack fleet and sandbox technology to mitigate noise, dust and impacts. All produced oil and gas will be connected to permanent pipeline. All fresh water will be delivered to location via a temporary lay flat pipeline for completion operations. Additionally, Bayswater typically utilizes a clear colorless refined distillate derived from petrohydrocarbons for drilling mud, which is called D822. We do utilize group three muds when available. However, due to recent supply chain uncertainty, we're unable to commit to group three muds on specific wells. Many of our BMPs are geared specifically towards reducing air emissions. Those BMPs include that electrical power will be connected at the production site that will provide power to a portion of the production facility. Instrument air will be utilized to run pneumatic devices to reduce fugitive emissions. Weekly and monthly LDAR and AVO inspections will be performed. Continuous air monitoring technology will provide additional alerts on any VOCs, particulate, and methane readings above background levels. All gas and vapors are captured, compressed, and sold into sales lines, including from oil and water production tanks and vent glass arriving from compressor maintenance and repair. Leaf hatches on atmospheric tanks are used for crude oil storage will be closed, latched, and sealed during normal operations. During designated ozone action days, impacts will be monitored and reduced to pose minimal change to existing conditions. This includes sending email alerts to our production team and limiting well unloading and maintenance operations, as well as non-emergency work requiring tank, vessel, and flow line maintenance whenever operationally feasible. Drilling and completions operations are examples of operations that cannot feasibly be started and stopped due to ozone action days. Additionally, the proposed facility does include the use of 10 oil tanks for storage purposes only. This is to maintain potential interruption to oil pipeline takeaway that is outside of Bayswater's control. It is not feasible for this location to be tankless because Bayswater does not own and operate our own oil gathering system. 
We sell to a third party with a sales point on each location, and we are required to meet crude oil specs at the third party lacked. Our low pressure tanks allow the oil a final flash point so that it can meet those specs. It is also not feasible to shut in the wells in the scenario that the pipeline capacity is insufficient. Because in our area of the DJ Basin, wells respond very poorly to unplanned shutdowns and restarts. Without any buffer storage on these large pads, any pipeline interruption would result in the shutdown of the entire pad. So these 10 tanks of oil storage allow for continued production of the pad during short periods of pipeline interruption. <clears throat> Also, many of our BMPs focus on protecting water resources during the unlikely, unlikely scenario of a release. Also, because the public comments that we received were both related to water resources, we did want to send, spend some time describing these BMPs in detail. So Bayswater has three layers of containment to protect resources, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary containment is the tanks. All chemicals are stored in sealed chemical totes with secondary containment and appropriate avian protection. All liquid, liquid hydrocarbons are stored in steel storage tanks with full vapor control collection and that are inside a secondary containment. Secondary containment is the use of a liner. A poly liner with firm foam berms will be utilized under the drilling rig, mud tank, shakers, drill cutting bill, bins, and under all equipment containing chemical or diesel fuel use during completions operations. Synthetic engineered liners will be under all tanks during production operations, which leads us to tertiary containment, which is the use of berms. During the production phase, tank berms and separator berms are constructed of steel rings. Tank berms are designed, as we just discussed, to contain 150% of the capacity of the largest tank. Containment burns will prevent leaking and resist degradation from erosion <laughs> or routine operation. All berms will be visually checked periodically to ensure proper working condition. During drilling operation, mud storage tanks have berms around them and location berms will be utilized during completions operations as well. Additionally, field-wide stormwater management and spill prevention plans are in place to mitigate and manage all surface disturbance. Finally, the 0.58 acre marginal wetland is upgradient from the pad, meaning that if the, a potential spill not contained by these BMPs I just went through would not migrate towards the wetland. Bayswater is committed to being a good neighbor and to building long standing relationships with key stakeholders, including municipalities and their residents. While the Garnet 21K pad is outside of any city limits, it is nearby three cities. That's Alt, Eaton, and Severance. Bayswater is highly engaged in each of these communities. Some of the government community engagement over the past year is outlined in this slide. I'd like to highlight that in the town of Alt, we hosted the mayor and board trustees on the field tour, donated oil and gas equipment to the Alt Pierce Fire Department, and are working together to complete their oil and gas training facility. In the city of Eaton, we hosted the mayor, board of trustee, and town advisor on a field tour and sponsored multiple local events. In the town of Severance, we hosted Severance Town Planner, community development director on a field tour, presented to the Severance Town Council, and had a high-level sponsorship of their annual local event. In summary, Bayswater is pleased to present our Garnet 21K pad to you today and believes that it is the best location to develop these minerals from, for many reasons, including that we went to lengths to find a location with only one RBU within 2,000 feet, and that is outside of 2,000 feet from a disproportionately impacted community. We received informed consent for the one RBU within 2,000 feet. We have first class and comprehensive BMPs to protect the surrounding environment. Colorado Parks and Wildlife granted us a waiver to COGCC Rule 1202A3. And finally, that the director did recommend this application for approval. At this point, I'll open it up to any questions that you may have. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think what we'd like to do before we open it up for commissioner questions to the panel is recognize Jason Maxey, who is now in the panel. 
and we can hear from Weld County. And then after that, we would open it up for commissioner questions. Good morning, Mr. Maxey. Thanks for being with us. Good morning, Chair Robbins and rest of the commission members. Thank you very much for having me uh, this Wednesday morning to say a few comments regarding the Weld County process for the Bayswater Garnet location location that is before you right now on the docket. Um, apologies for being a little bit late, but it is interesting being after the applicant this morning. So uh, that was good to hear from Lauren and team over at Bayswater. And uh, they mentioned a lot of good things about this uh, permit that um, uh, played into the Weld County's review as well. So just a, a few comments from Weld County. And, and as always, happy to answer any questions I can regarding the local government permitting process. So Weld County comments uh, were submitted and uploaded on the form 2A in general. And I just wanna um, give a shout out to COGCC staff, uh, Brian uh, in particular, uh, who is with the OGLA group, um, because there was a little snafu with upload of the 2A comments, but uh, due to our, our good relationship with the OGLA staff, Brian reached out to me and we were able to get that rectified. And so I did wanna make that known to the commission and give a kudos to to him and to our relationship for being able to work uh, closely together and to identify those types of things and be able to um, get those things uploaded. Um, our process started way back in November of 2020. And uh, you all were in the, in the thick of rulemaking at the time. The new rules had not come out yet uh, for um, the COGCC. But on November 18th, 2020 is when we engaged with Bayswater on a pre-application meeting. You know, again, this was before uh, the new rules. This was kind of before the, the new MOU with Weld County. Um, and, and it was just a busy time. And so uh, even though COGCC staff did not uh, participate in that, um, it, it was in a, in a period of very busy time. And so it was definitely understandable. Uh, but regardless, you can tell uh, all the way up until just a few days ago, uh, we had close interactions with staff regarding this application, as I just mentioned. Um, we did do a site visit a couple of days prior to that. We didn't find any obvious incompatibilities with the proposed location as we were starting our process. Bayswater did submit their application to us, their formal application on February 19th, 2021, and it was complete and compliant with Weld County Code. And so we moved forward with the processing of that application. Um, Lauren already went over their alternates, uh, which we went over as well with them throughout our process. And so we agree with their um, discussion and, and all the slides that she showed um, regarding their alternates. We did send out referral requests as usual for our WOGLA process. Those were sent out February 26th, 2021. Now, one item to note about referral comments, and this is noted in the final order that was issued by the hearing officer is that uh, there might be some questions about the access road. And, and we worked very closely with uh, Bayswater about the access point for this location, which was shown on one of the maps that uh, Lauren showed. There was a little bit of discussion regarding a access point that was to the east of the location that kind of headed to the southeast, if you're looking at the map. That, that access that's right there currently um, actually parallels a lakeside lateral ditch um, and so through the referral process, and again, this is testament to how, how the WOGLA works and, and the relationships we have with uh, multiple people and agencies around Well County, the Lakeside, excuse me, the, the Lakeside Lateral Ditch Company did provide referral comments and they discussed prohibiting access to the Garnet location via that road that was already existing that paralleled that ditch. Um, and then working with Bayswater, they understood the, the concerns about being right next to a ditch as well. And so if you read the final order from the hearing officer, you'll see a condition of approval in there that restricts using that access point. And that's why the access road is actually to the west of the location and comes straight south down to County Road 78, as indicated on the maps that Lauren showed. Um, we did not receive any comments from the public or any applications for intervention throughout our WOGLA process. As Lauren mentioned, we had our hearing in April of 2021, April 8th to be exact. And the hearing officer considered testimony from all parties, including the applicant, um, and subsequently approved the permit. The final order was recorded on April 23rd with our clerk and recorder, um, again, per our code, and then subsequently noticed in the Greeley Tribune on April 25th of 2021. And the hearing officer's final orders uh, do include additional BMPs and conditions of approval that do bind Bayswater to uh, certain requirements. Um, the one that I just mentioned regarding the access road is one of those. If you look on the final order, 
um, it is it is listed on there. Uh, excuse me, as uh, da, 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 da. as number five on the final order. Um, excuse me, that's controlling dust. Um, it is mentioned in here. Excuse me, I apologize. I should have had this pulled up. Um, under the final order, it is talked about um, up under the testimony that is um, provided from not only the applicant, but also our staff that that access road will not be used. But the final order does also mention additional BMPs such as sound studies, dust control measures, um, use of a quiet frack fleet, among others, which will be protective of the health, safety, and welfare of Well County residents, wildlife, and the environment. And uh, finally, Well County does agree with the COGCC's director's recommendation of approval. Um, so with all that being said, again, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Apologies on being a few minutes late and happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Great. Thank you, Mr. Maxey, for being uh, with us and providing Well County's perspective, which as you know, under our rules is an important consideration for the commissioners as we review uh, potential OGDPs. Uh, with that, um, I would probably ask the applicant to stop the screen share so that I can see everybody in a little better fashion, and then we would open it up for questions from commissioners. Who would like to go first? Commissioner Ackerman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can lead us off. I, I wanted to thank Bayswater and Ms. Walsh for the uh, excellent presentation and for all the work that they've done uh, on this pad um, up to this point. Um, especially want to commend you for the uh, significant search for the best location for development of these resources and the ALA that you provided and agree that you, uh, that you although weren't able to avoid all receptors, did find a, a suitable location for development here. Um, that said, I did have just a couple of questions as might be anticipated about, uh, about the wetland. Um, I really appreciated your uh, detail on the presentation about the, the reasons that this is no longer a functional wetland. And I just had one question associated with that. You mentioned two wetlands uh, that were NWI mapped wetlands. And the, the first one, I'll call it number one for lack of a better term, was underneath and northeast of the pad. But I believe your presentation largely focused on the, 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 the wetland that's north of the area that has since been reduced to a, a, a marginal and small wetland due to uh, changes in water use and storage locations associated with the pond, which is not a, an uncommon occurrence in Colorado. I especially appreciate that you, uh, that you addressed that this isn't a drought related change, but rather a surface use related change. That said, um, I didn't really hear a lot of discussion about the, the wetland number one under the pad, other than it was visited on site and determined to no longer be a wetland. Is it also associated with the change in water use um, uh, associated with storage in the pond, or was it erroneously mapped? Can you provide just a little bit more detail about the, uh, the wetland, uh, the, the mapped wetland under the pad and just northeast of the pad? Sure, no problem. So the map that was under the pad um, is the first one we're talking about. Just to clarify, the second one is the one that is northeast and then kind of continues up north of the pad. So the one that's under the pad, to my knowledge, it was not used as a pond. I believe it's just been a change in the area that is no longer a mapped wetland. But I think I'd have to look back at our wetland report to get further details on that. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. The reason I ask is because obviously if 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 conditions could change and it could be a wetland again, then certainly saying it's currently not a wetland, you know, probably isn't isn't good enough. But if it if we can determine that it has historically been a wetland and is no longer a wetland for X reasons or, uh, you know, was erroneously mapped in the first place, I think that would be helpful. Um, if, if you've got anybody on staff that could that could uh, further answer that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, in the meantime, I also wanted to mention um, that you had uh, two raptor nests mapped on location. One was confirmed to be a destroyed uh, nest due to the tree falling down. The other one, I believe, was off the, the site, but 140 feet away. Can you 
talk just a little bit about um, your protection of that raptor nest. Although it's currently unoccupied, they certainly yep. can be occupied again. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. And I actually do have a slide in the appendix that shows a map of this if you guys would like to see it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so here are the two locations where the raptor surveys were completed. Um, the green <clears throat> triangle here shows a raptor nest that was originally present when we first went out to this location that um, the second time that we went out recently in July of this year, the entire tree that the map that the nest was in has fallen, so it's no longer there. The second raptor's nest is down here in orange. And in July, when they went out there, it was inactive, unoccupied. And we have talked in detail with Brandon Moret from CPW about this. And um, his recommendation is that since our plans to begin construction and continuous operations will be before nesting season, he has requested that we do one additional field verification two weeks before we begin construction. And as long as the nest is uninhabited at that point, we are good to continue construction. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. I appreciate that. And thank you for the uh, careful monitoring of that. And I just wanted to point out that that's not an ignored feature and something that uh, that you have looked at in detail and will continue to look at and appreciate that. Absolutely. And with that, Mr. Chair, I don't have any further questions uh, with my one question pending. Great. Others with questions? Uh, others with questions? Commissioner McGowan? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you for your presentation today and for clarifying some questions that I had within your presentation. Um, I'm wondering how far in advance you have to plan for your drilling mud. And so I'm appreciative that there's supply chain issues. I do think that the group three is the best, especially when you're within 2000 feet of a, um, a, a, a dwelling unit where someone is living. And I think that you know, odors are one of the biggest complaints that our folks get. I also know that the group three has the lowest BTEX um, ingredients. And so I'm just, I appreciate that there's a supply chain issue. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about, you can, you'll try to get the group three, but if there's a supply chain issue, then we'll use the group two. Is it possible to have that discussion? Absolutely. So I will have Jeff Overman, our drilling manager, discuss that. And I think he can also discuss some other alternatives that we've come up with in past paths to reducing odor. And, and sorry, for me, it's not just the odor, it's also the BTEX. Okay, Anderson. Gotcha. Thanks for the questions. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, our goal is to use the, the group three. We've been using it on uh, on our rigs when it's available, um, and it's 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 not a planning um, supply chain issue. Um, interruptions in the in the rail system is what has caused the interruptions in the past. So strikes and and stuff like that. So you can kind of do plenty of planning and still um, hit a snag. So um, yeah, the BTEX is lower in the, in the group threes. Um, and I, I think there's probably no way to remove that from the D822 fluid. Um, but as far as the odor goes, we've been really successful with, um, using D822 and, uh, a product that we, uh, that we use called odor armor, um, and making it more comfortable for, uh, the, the, uh, uh, RBUs that are, that are close and can smell and and uh, um, kind of a, a little test case for it was on the blend pad. We had a RBU pretty close and uh, um, used that product and um, complaints were were, uh, uh, were were gone after that. So um, it's it's our desire. It's what we'll. Uh, it's, it's definitely what our what we want to do. Um, but it's sometimes it's it's just not uh, it's just not available due to supply chain issues and you know having the having the rig sit there wait um, can be incredibly impactful as well um, with the time spent on pad and and stuff like that if we if we just have to wait so I guess the the, the with the supply chain issues you can do all the planning in the world but um, in 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 this day and age it's still uh, not 100% uh, reliable for uh, supply chain. Thank you. I, I'm wondering if you are amenable to maybe committing at minimum to the group two mud and trying to use group three if it's available, if you can get it. 
Um, group two, I don't know of any group two. Um, Aren't you already, uh, that's what's in your application is the group two? Uh, well, DA22 is actually, it just barely misses on a few uh, properties to technically be a group two. It's extremely close. So um, I believe it's a flashpoint um, uh, that's not quite at the right spec and uh, BTEX that's not at the, at the right spec. But absolutely, I, that, that's already in there for our, uh, for our BMPs to use the D822 that is extremely close. Yeah. Does someone understand what I'm asking for? And whether or not you can commit to trying to get the group three. And if you can't, you use the group two that's in your application. Yes, we can absolutely commit to that. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate you responding to the operationally feasible language that you put in for high ozone days. That's the first time I've seen an operator kind of qualify. And I, I, I get there might be some circumstances where if you're in the middle of drilling and then we have a high ozone day, you just can't stop drilling. And so I kind of just wanna make sure that we have an understanding of um, not because you don't wanna do something on high ozone day, but because you can't. And so um, I'm appreciative of you explaining what operationally feasible meant to you so that we were able to actually kind of figure out how to um, implement it and enforce it if necessary. And then finally, I'm wondering if you can explain again the 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 point of needing 10 tanks, even though you're piping oil, and that, sorry, you went through it kind of quickly, something about a flashpoint. And um, I, I understand that you're using a third party midstream um, supplier or carrier, but it seems that 10 tanks is a lot to have on site given that you're gonna have pipeline takeaway. And so I'm just wondering if you could explain that capacity need it's, you know, it's a larger footprint, it's more opportunities for things to spill and leak and all of those things. And so if you could kind of slow down a little bit and run through that, I would appreciate it. Sure, no problem. And I think Ryan Kaminke, our production and facilities manager is probably the best person to get more in depth on that. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks commissioner for the question. I know we kind of hit on it last time on the Ruby, but I can go into more detail uh, today. So. So what we plan for, um, you know, the reason for 10 tanks um, mostly is um, we, we set up a typical 10 tank, um, only six of those are used for bulk, kind of our, our, our main volume of oil that is being sent to the tanks from separation equipment and then pumped through the lact. Um, we do utilize the other tanks for um, test tanks at, as far as allocation. So we, we rotate separation equipment through um, piping to to direct single or or uh, two tanks to allow for, for the the confirmation of accuracy that we um, we need for for our allocation for our, our meters um, since we we do commingle everything um, we, we do want to verify the accuracy of our, our oil meters so that's what we use typically two or four of those tanks for um, we also would set up a tank for what we call kind of a divert and bad oil tank that that given third party lack control, there are times due to um, the S and W readings or 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 pressure or just general turn on that the the lack will divert oil back into our system and we have to have a tank um, separate that that um, can accept that oil and we don't want that going back into our main kind of bulk tank setup. So, so of the of the ten tanks, you know, six or even five would be used for bulk um, um, bulk storage and then pump down. Um, we have one divert tank and then some for for testing. Um, so that's kind of the, the reason for those. Um, we also want the storage ability for, you know, if there is an electrical outage. Um, you know, some sort of interference with pipeline. Um, we would prefer due to the way the wells flow in this area with with gas slip operation and lots of mechanical equipment to to not have the well shut in um, it is quite labor intensive to have a site fully down for for a 12 or 24 hour period and and bring that up let alone having that happen in in january um, it, it can create issues and operational uh, concerns there for us so 
So the the runtime of the wells is important as well as the the speed and the control of the lack that that moves the oil off site. You know, we we cannot control that. So there is some some communication that happens monthly with the the third party. Um, and, and allowing the, the extra tank room uh, can help with any sort of control because it is a constant pump rate and sometimes the wells do not flow um, constant. Um, I will say, similar to what we did commit to on the Ruby, I'm, I'm comfortable committing to a, I think it was a year, we would reevaluate the need for, for 10 tanks and we will definitely look at um, downsizing that. And in additional comments, we, we are, Currently in the engineering review and design process for a, a tank light system, um, which I would I would hope for is a, a four tank setup with some some surge vessels. So um, similar issues we're seeing with with lead times on equipment and supply chain. We we've got some equipment on order, but we do not expect to see that and, and get the equipment in operation until probably early next year. Um, but as far as our process goes, um, it's something we've been looking at. Operationally, engineering, um, electrical, and our automation teams are evaluating tank light as it is a big, kind of a big process change for for us and all of our departments. But something we are evaluating and working towards, and hope to have um, in operation early next year. I I really appreciate you remembering the conversation we had on the the Ruby, and I I was like, oh, the Garnet, I I get it now. Um, so I, I'm super appreciative. I would I would like to add that language of coming back and seeing you still need those 10 tanks and trying to reduce that footprint if we can and the opportunity for potential um, leaks or spills. And I'm really, really um, pleased to hear that you all are, are looking at moving to tank light. I think that's the kind of A plus activity that we're looking for and I'm appreciative that you all are looking for that. So thank you for those two things. Questions from commissioners? Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation. I want to start off saying I thought that was a very helpful presentation. Um, you know, I think that as Commissioner Ackerman mentioned, that some of the some of the water issues are obviously very significant here. And so I appreciate you also taking additional time to not just list what BMPs you have, but spending some time specifically talking about how the BMPs work and, and some more detail on it. So I thought that was helpful. Um, I, I also just want to say, and I, this is almost <laughs> to, to other operators as, well, I, I, operators as well, I think it was very helpful for you to demonstrate that you had a proposed location. It looked pretty good, but you still did ultimately change it. And I think that's a, that's a good sign in our process that it is working. Um, it, it's not a rubber stamp. It's something that that everybody's working towards to make sure that we are getting the best available spots. And so I think describing that you actually did change location is very helpful in addition to the, the analysis that you went through and looking at the alternative locations. Um, and the one question I just really wanted to touch on briefly, um, because a couple of my other questions were already answered, was could you go into a little bit of detail on the request to modify the DSU from 24 wells to 23 and then adding the, the well bore spacing unit? Um, just, just a little curious as to why you decided to do the well bore spacing unit as, to, as opposed to continuing to have 24 in the DSU. Absolutely. I think this question is probably best answered by Tyler Hammond, our district landman, or maybe Joe Pershala, whichever one of you feels best equipped to discuss it. Do we have Tyler on? Yeah. Yeah, Tyler, do you want to take it? I'm happy to give it a shot if you'd like. Uh, I, I can take that one. Um, so that, what, what we originally applied for was actually a 24 well DSU and two WSUs. Uh, one on the north side and one on the south side. And the reason that that change was made was in this process, we actually went and reduced our setbacks on the northern side of that. So we so so in so in order to get down to um, in, in order to get rid of the northern WSU on that side, um, and that allowed us to decrease that by one additional well. 
we ended up keeping the uh, well bore spacing unit on the south side of the on the south side of the DSU. It will be for one well also, um, due to the offset wells on the south side of that on the, on the south side of that WSU. So because of the existing production down there, we kept that WSU. And since there's no existing production to the north, we decreased that setback, which um, allowed us to get rid of you know required us to get rid of one well in the plan. Uh, but but allowed us to get rid of that WSU on that side. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I, I assumed it might have been something from existing production out there, but I just wanted to to clarify because I thought it was interesting based on the setbacks that existed if um, why the WSU was necessary. Um, and again, I, I you know I I want to again say that I I concur with Commissioner McGowan's comments there as well. Um, I fully understand some of the, the difficulties when it comes to supply chain issues, but I do appreciate the, the desire to, you know, commit to the group three mud when, when available, as well as trying to, to look back at the tanks and, and move towards the tank light. I, I think that's an important thing to, to look forward to. So um, understanding some of the production limitations at this time, but I appreciate looking forward to that. Uh, that's the only questions I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Cross, Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of questions uh, so that I fully understand what's being presented. Um, and Commissioner McGowan asked a question, and I just wanted to follow up on it a little bit to make sure that I understand, because some of the narrative indicates that the that the tanks that are um, being proposed on site are there in case there was midstream operations that shut down or had maintenance, they were storage tanks. But I think I'm also hearing that these are actually a final stage of separation before the oil goes to the lact. And so is this the standard um, procedure for uh, Bayswater as far as utilizing these tanks as a, as a final separation? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question there, Commissioner. Um, and what what I guess I would, ref you know, your comment of separation, it's not really um, a separation issue. It's more related to to RVP spec, which is the, the reed vapor pressure of the oil. Um, it it has to have certain specs that that really only happen when when oil reaches um, certain temperatures or or close to atmosphere pressure. So so through our our process equipment. Um, upstream, we we do and and hope that we can achieve those those RVP levels um, to meet pipeline specs. Um, one thing that we do know is that there are occasional um, times where where upstream equipment um, we cannot, based on our testing, we cannot meet those RVP levels. Um, so the final tanks, we do know that um, all testing that we have done out of the atmospheric tanks that, that sit slightly above, you know, atmosphere uh, ounces of pressure there um, allow for the crude to, to, you know, stabilize and, and small volumes of flash are captured off those tanks. We, we compress the vapors off of the tanks, send them back into sales. Um, you know, we, we aren't actually using it to separate any oil or, or other um, or sorry, any water out of the, the oil prior to, to sales. It's more for a, a final, um, you know, stabilization prior to the pump down into the, into the pipeline. And that, and that, that and so, so, and again, I'm just making sure that I understand the, the proposed operation. <clears throat> so all produced crude will go into tanks at one stage. Correct. Yes, we, we have several stages of, of upstream, um, you know, flash through through our separators, through through our our bulk, our bulk oil vessels, um, and at that point, then all oil uh, enters the enters the final tanks for for lacked um, sales. But what we are working through the design is a is a tank life where we basically stabilize the oil prior to the atmospheric tanks at at the, the, the pipeline spec RVP and, and control um, the flow from a, from a vessel, a sealed vessel straight into the LAC, um, which there's, there's some difficulties and in, in engineering challenges there, but that's what we're, we're working through. Good, thanks for the answer there. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to 
uh, chat just a little bit about uh, the cumulative impacts plan and 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 some of the some of the offset cumulative impacts with the plugging and abandonment of certain sites and the removal of certain tanks associated with this OGDP. And I think I'm, I'm reading that there'd be 13 wells plugged or have been plugged with one additional well that may be plugged as well as 16 tanks. Although it wasn't totally clear to me whether those tanks had already been removed or, or, or will be removed. And so I wonder if you just talk a little bit about that. Sure. So um, all of the wells that we mentioned in there have already already been plugged in this area. So there are no future vertical or horizontal well plugs that are planned. Um, I don't know the answer to the tank question. Would someone else at Bayswater be able to address that? If not, we might have to. I think if you, yeah, we might have to look into that. Uh, Commissioner Mesner, if you're if you're referring to old vertical tanks um, and if they're removed from site, I would I would need to look further into that. Um, but depending on vintage, we you know we we do not leave tanks on site. We we complete a a, a vertical um, you know tear out and and close out that that process. But I would need to look into further uh, further into those vertical wells. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting this information from from the form 2B that you submitted, and so I'm just confirming that that's accurate and that this has either been done or is is um, to be done as part right. of the application, just to ensure that it's correct. So, yeah, I, I believe all of those tanks have been removed, and and that we've actually been out there and done re done some reclamation and reseeded out there, Ryan, and Commissioner Mesner. Okay. And so, but there was one well that was maybe going to be plugged, but it hasn't been plugged yet. And so that one's off the table. Is that what I'm hearing? So like that hasn't been completed yet. Um, that that one is actually operated by PDC. Um, so that's that's why we can't commit to plugging that. It'll likely be taken offline by this, and we'll be in discussions with them on what to do with that well in the future. I would say it's highly likely that it does get plugged, but we since we're not the operator, we can't commit to plugging that one. Sure. I just wanted to make sure that that was that I wasn't making that up. So, um, so essentially, we've got 13 wells that are plugged and 16 tanks that are removed, according to the cumulative impacts report. That's offsetting cumulative impacts to this to this application. Um, I think the only other question I have, and this is perhaps a question for staff, um, as well as the operator, but. I'm reading in the BMPs that the operator is committing to um, group two drilling muds. That's what the BMP says. I've also heard in testimony today that perhaps the intent is to use a type or a group one drilling mud that almost is a group two. So that there is no confusion, do we need to make any adjustments to the BMPs associated with the Form 2A so that um, the operator may be allowed to use this or, or is the Group 2 drilling muds going to be the minimum requirement? Sure, Messner, um, we're going to be bringing in the lead OGLA who reviewed this 2A and um, Brian Christopher and Mr. Christopher can address that matter. Okay. Uh, can I get the question restated as I was joining it, cut out for a few seconds there? Uh, no problem, Mr. Christopher. I'm just confirming that my understanding is, is in reading the Form 2A and the BMPs associated with it, that the operator is committed to utilizing Group 2 drilling muds. In testimony today, it seems that the product that they're, that they're choosing to utilize um, in lieu of being able to access Group 3, and I do acknowledge that conversation occurred, um, may actually be a Group 1 drilling mud in a formal classification versus a Group 2. And does that cause problems with the proposed BMP. This will lead to some, uh, we will need to change some BMPs to address this. I wanna double check exactly what the status of the, uh, 
was it the 882 drilling mud and confirmed status, and that may lead to some changes in BMPs to allow that specific drilling mud. So yes, this is something we can and would need to revise on the Form 2A. Okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate it, Mr. Christopher. Um, and my final question is just because I was having a little bit of a hard time deciphering some of the BMPs as I cross-referenced it with the CDPHE recommendations. Um, were there CDPHE recommendations in their consultation that um, that Bayswater chose not to implement? I, I know that there was a couple maybe in the 2A that around PFAS, and I'm assuming that's because you're not going to use products associated with or that have PFAS in it, but I wasn't sure if there were others that were in the recommendation that um, that you didn't incorporate in your BMPs. There were, and I am pulling up the spreadsheet now if you'd like me to go through and list the ones that we're unable to comply with. That'd be great because for some reason I couldn't find it when I was looking through the application, that, that, that spreadsheet, so. Sure. So there were a number that were not applicable. So I'll just go through the ones that were a, our answer was does not commit, if that sounds okay. Sure. Okay. Um, so the first one was electric, electrification, um, being able to use electric pumps for hydraulic fracturing. Mm -hmm. And our reasoning for that was that Bayswater does not solely use electric pumps due to op equipment not being available in sufficient quantity in the basin. Okay. Um, tankless design was another one, which we've already discussed here that we're kind of working on our tank light version, hoping to implement um, early next year. Engines, operator will use tier four or better engines for drilling we were unable to commit to. And I think that's just based on the current um, engines that we have on location for our drilling rigs. Um, operator will use zero emission desiccant hydrators or 98% control of hydrocarbon emissions for glycol hydrators. We were not able to commit to. Group three drilling muds, we were unable to commit to, which we've discussed here. So that's air. Um, on the water tab, operator will recycle or beneficially reuse flow back and produce water. Um, so we are not able to commit to that due to our commitment to surrounding residents to reduce truck traffic by means of piping completions water to the location. Um, that means that it's not, that it's gonna be fresh water and not reused. Okay, on to waste tab, we were able to commit to all of those. And then as you just uh, mentioned earlier, we could not commit to the PFAS items. And that was because you, you, you don't utilize products with PFAS in them and that was the reasoning there? That's correct. Um, but we do work closely with the Alt Pierce Fire Department. As we mentioned, we're helping them um, build a training facility for oil and gas locations. So we are in close communication with them. Um, and I don't believe any of our donations have been budgeted towards the transition of PFAS, but we are in close communication with them. Okay. Uh, thank you for answering my questions. Absolutely. Thanks for the question. Additional questions from commissioners? I do have one follow-up question, if we have a moment. Um, to address Commissioner Ackerman's question on the wetland. So I did pull up the original wetland delineation report um, and it does clearly state, so this is for the wetland that's under the pad. Uh, it does clearly state that there are no wetlands present within the project area. My understanding is that there's no suggestion that future hydrology changes will occur to make it a wetland in the future. 
Thanks for the follow up, Ms. Walsh. Appreciate that. Of course. All right, seeing no further questions, we will move to the deliberation phase of our consideration of this uh, OGDP. Anybody desire to start up on deliberations? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll start with, uh, you know, it, I, I, I know that this uh, application started prior to the implementation of Senate Bill 19-181, um, saw some changes to the initial surface use due to the review by the director during the time that we were um, utilizing the director's recommendation or the director's, um, uh, Chairman Robbins, I can't remember what it's called, it director's review, I can't remember now. Objective criteria. Objective criteria, <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, and so there's definitely been some movement in the location. I appreciate the, um, what I thought was a very thorough alternative location analysis, the on the ground evaluation of the um, delineated wetlands, um, I think was important as well. <clears throat> uh, um, I do think that a lot of the BMPs that are being proposed are strong BMPs. Um, I will note that there is a um, RBU within 2000 feet on this particular location because that RBU has an informed consent associated with it. That I, I, you know, I'm not evaluating this location um, through the lens of substantial equivalency. Um, I do think that should there should this be not have informed consent, and I was reviewing this application through the lens of substantial equivalency, I do think that um, there would be some improvements to some of the BMPs that I would like to see, um, particularly around um, the utilization of tanks, um, the group three drilling muds, um, and the uh, uh, electrification of um, production operations and the utilization of tier four engines and, and some other things that I think would be important should there not be an informed consent if I'm looking at this as best management practices, the best management practices associated with being substantially equivalent outside of the review of informed consent. But understanding that there's informed consent associated with this one, um, that's the lens that I'm reviewing this through. Um, I appreciate that both the oil and gas is being um, taken away from site via pipeline. I think that's important. Um, I also appreciate that 13 wells have been plugged and 16 tanks have been removed uh, as part of the uh, application as well. I think that shows some good offset um, uh, adverse impact mitigation. Um, and uh, I think those are my my thoughts. You know, I will be in support of this application. Other commissioners with thoughts? Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I I also am in favor of this application. Um, you know, I I agree. I I think that I'll be interested to see when when Bayswater water comes to us, you know, in the next year or so to see what kind of progress they've made on, on some of their tank light facilities and, and that kind of infrastructure, um, but kind of under what they're, they're currently operating with, you know, I, I appreciate their, their analysis. I appreciate the, the work that they've done to talk, not just to the RBUs close by, but their work with the communities as well um, to try and make sure that, that they're working with those communities to, um, make sure that they're being good stewards as well. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll maybe ask one question um, and, may, and maybe this is better for, for AG Davenport as well, but you know, in, in terms of if we were to, to make a motion here, how do we handle the, the potential change to the BMP with respect to the, the group tier, the group two mud um, that, that was discussed as we do that? AG Mercer. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Cross. Um, 
So what I would recommend is that in your motion, um, you direct uh, staff to develop the appropriate BMP. I don't, we don't for the purposes here need to come up with the exact language of the BMP, um, but I would direct staff to craft a BMP to re um, or revise the BMP to allow the operator to use at a minimum um, the specific uh, drilling mud that they've said they're planning to use. And um, if the commission wants to um, go with um, the BMP proposed by Commissioner McGowan to use tier three drilling mud if that becomes available. Does that make sense? I know I got a, might have gotten a little muddled in there. It, it does, and I and I appreciate that. Um, but but overall, as I kind of mentioned during the questions, I, I think it was it was good to hear some of the explanation, especially the detailed explanation, not just with respect to the alternative locations, but also with respect to um, the the water BMPs and and the stormwater BMPs and and also just sort of the discussion of kind of I'll say preemptively talking about why why they have ten tanks and and not tank light in the beginning. So um, looking forward to to seeing kind of future applications and and how they handle that. But but appreciate the detail that they put into into this presentation. Does anyone desire to create uh, a motion? Commissioner Messer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move approval of, um, give me a second so I can pull up the docket number. 2203000044. That is the docket number. Um, with the uh, addition of uh, staff developing a BMP associated with the uh, group drilling muds um, associated with the application. We have a motion. Commissioner Cross. I, I would just modify that slightly to, to move for approval with the staff approved um, BMP with respect to the proposed drilling mud, um, but also adding that group three mud will be used when available and that they will reevaluate the, the necessity to have tent tanks as, as requested by Commissioner McGowan. Commissioner Messer, are you comfortable with that uh, friendly edit? I will revise my motion uh, incorporating the edit. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I will second the motion. And I think that we could probably use um, language that we used for the Ruby regarding going back and looking and seeing if the 10 tanks are still necessary and reducing if, if um, that's possible, just to, I think we could use what we did before. Mr. Messner, are you comfortable with that second friendly edit? Um, I am. Do we have a second to this motion? Second. Mr. McGowan seconded. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the folks from, uh, Bayswater, are, are you comfortable? Do you understand the motion that is on the table at this point in time? Yes, well? absolutely. We agree with the two BMP additions. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, before we take a vote, we have a chance for final discussions. Um, I'm in favor of the motion. I appreciate the questions, appreciate the application and the hard work uh, that's gone into this. And I think this is approvable under our rules and our regulatory protocol. Any further discussions? Mr. Chair, I will note just for the record that um, I wanna commend staff again for the work that they've done on this application. Uh, once uh, completion was determined, um, this is coming in front of us in the 90 day timeframe, which I think is a, a reasonable timeframe for a technical review of, a, of an OGDP application. Appreciate that point, Commissioner Messner. Final thoughts. Seeing no further final thoughts, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Bayswater. Thank you very much, staff. Uh, 
Commissioners, I would suggest we take our morning break. Uh, I need a little more time this morning. I've got another matter I've got to attend to. Um, it's 1038. Let's return at 11. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, for some reason I cannot see anybody, but it appears that I'm in the meeting. Apologies for whatever technical issues are there. Um, Mimi, can you hear me? Sorry, yes, we can. Okay, I can only see myself, which is a lovely way to enjoy a meeting. But why don't we go ahead? Um, why don't we make someone else chair and then I'll just listen in um, because I can hear folks and that's the most important. Commissioner Messer, I'm going to look to you to see if you would like to be chair. Um, sure, we can be chair. Thank you, Commissioner. With that, I believe we are ready to go. Um, this OGDP does not include a presentation from Mr. Maxey. It's not in Weld County. So um, we do have all the attendees ready to go. And Commissioner Messner, I just figured it out. I can see everybody. I don't know what's going on with my iPad. But um, so why don't we go ahead with the applicant? Great, good to see you again, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, and my name is Joe Prashala with Well Warren Sullivan Mech and Tooley on behalf of the applicant BNL Enterprise. And with me today are Peter Kondrat, the Chief Operating Officer of BNL, and Andrea Gross, uh, the project lead for upstream petroleum management and consultant for um, BNL. BNL is a registered operator in good standing with the commission and has satisfied the financial assurance requirements of the state. And before you today are two OGDP applications, both of which involve helium development in Los Animas County. And I think this might be a first time for uh, Commissioner Cross and uh, Commissioner Ackerman uh, on a helium plan. Uh, the first one is docket number 22010005. Uh, the application requests that the commission approve the state 35 and 36 2954 oil and gas development plan. And the plan includes approximately 1,040 acres, covering portions of sections 35 and 36 in Township 29 South, Range 54 West. There are two proposed oil and gas locations, the state 35 Northeast Northwest 2954 and the state 36 Southwest Southwest 2954. Both the locations would accommodate a single vertical well. There'd be two total vertical wells uh, under this application. And those are to explore for and produce helium gas from the Lions Formation. BNL has oil and gas leases from the Colorado State Land Board that include the right to produce helium gas. And those leases cover uh, respectively approximately 440 acres within section 35 and approximately 650 acres in section 36. The docket, the other docket is 22010011. And this application requests the commission to approve the state nine and 163054 oil and gas development plan. This plan includes approximately 800 acres that covers portions of sections nine and 16 township 30 south, range 54 west. Here there are again two oil and gas locations, the state nine southwest southeast. 3054 and the state 16 Southwest Southeast 3054. Again, one vertical well on each location and to explore for and produce helium gas from the Lions Formation. And similar to the other application, BNL has oil and gas leases from the Colorado State Land Board that uh, cover these lands and uh, provide BNL with the right to produce helium gas. Uh, the first lease is 160 acres in the south half, south half of section nine. And the other is 640 acres, which covers all of section 16. There is no uh, spacing request in this application. These lands are not subject to existing commission spacing orders. And uh, BNL is looking to develop pursuant to rule 401B. Uh, the form, lion's formation is less than 2,500 feet in depth. 
Uh, the wells are located more than 200 feet from the lease lines, and there are no other existing or permitted wells in the Lions formation within 300 feet of these proposed wells. Therefore, no spacing is required and spacing is not being applied for. The locations themselves are in rural rangeland on state land board leases. BNL has conducted site visits with the state land board and the Colorado Parks and Wildlife was also included in the state land board review process of these locations. Following the consultation process and site visits, the state land board has approved these locations. Uh, the locations do not meet any criteria under 304B2B, so no alternative location analyses were required and then were submitted. The locations are not within 2,000 feet of any buildings, high occupancy, any residential buildings, high occupancy building units, or schools. Uh, <clears throat> Los Animas County is the relevant local government. Uh, BNL has consulted with the county on the locations, and the county has not objected to these locations. Uh, pursuant to the county direction, they don't issue the final permits on these locations um, until after the OGDP process and having the final permits issued as a condition of approval on the Form 2As. Uh, as for notice, BNL has noticed all uh, parties entitled to notice under Rule 504A and 303E1. No petitions or protests were received. On September 1st, the director issued her recommendations, which recommend approval of both of these applications. And it's BNL's position that the applications satisfy the Conservation Act and Commission rules. And BNL respectfully requests that the Commission adopt the director recommendation and approve the applications. And with that, I would turn it over to Mr. Condrat and Ms. Gross, who will provide an introduction to BNL, an overview of helium exploration and development and then provide some more specifics as to these development plans and locations. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Chair Robbins. Uh, commissioners, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, Peter Condrat, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of BNL and Blue Star Helium. I'm going to run through a brief presentation file that kind of outlines who BNL and Blue Star Helium is, go over our exploration and development plan. Um, just a little bit of background about myself is that uh, I'm an oil and gas, uh, been working for about 20, 25 years in that sector. And then for the last five years, I've been in the helium space. I've originated um, some discoveries and production in other areas of the USA, um, have extensive experience in kind of from the permitting, the drill bit, the completion, the production, the helium plant to market operations. So I'm hoping that I can address any questions that you may have. Um, my understanding is you've been furnished with a copy of this presentation. I'm getting ready to share my screen. Okay, do you guys see my screen? And obviously it's sharing the wrong screen because you guys can't see the presentation mode. Apologize about this. How about now? Do you guys see the presentation mode for the screen? It's not in presentation mode. Yeah, we can see the screen, just not in presentation, Peter. Okay. Got it now. Uh, you, you guys got it now? Yes. Thank you for your patience. Okay. So uh, as Joe has indicated, we're going to go through the OGDPs for state 35 and 36, 9 and 16. Um, this is just disclaimer, important information. Um, Blue Star Helium is the owner of BNL Enterprise, BNL is a subsidiary and the operating arm of Blue Star Helium. And it is the uh, registered with the COGC as the operator of the wells to drill and produce. This is a brief outline of our presentation, just a little bit more about Blue Star Helium, a little bit about helium, helium versus oil and gas impacts, 
the Los Animas Geology, Los Animas County Helium Geology, and Julian Operations. Um, Blue Star Helium, the parent company BNL Enterprise, is listed on Australian Stock Exchange. Um, we are very highly regulated, transparent company. Um, we're an independent exploration and production company, and we're focused on high-grade helium hydrocarbon-free resources in Colorado. The Los Animas County is a unique spot in the world, like other spots where you have helium occurrences, we have no hydrocarbons. We have no methane, no oil, um, or less than 1% all combined. It's a very minimal uh, part of our production stream, and we do not uh, generate or capture any hydrocarbons for any type of revenue. Our sole revenue is from helium. Um, we are led by our Australian professionals. Um, we've got two in Australia that have originated this company, and then they developed the Colorado-based team. I help lead the operating, uh, the operations um, with the drilling, the permitting, completion, production, marketing. Andrea Gross is our third party consultant that helps lead the permitting environmental and legal activities um, with Joe. And we also have a Denver based chief financial officer. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. You guys can follow up with any questions, but helium is a critical mineral in the United States. It's monatomic. Um, helium has both gas and has properties both in the gaseous form and liquid form that are unique. It has no other comparable element that can be used. Just a brief, you know, helium is inert, noble gas. It doesn't react so that helium is used in semiconductors, microchip processors, MRI machines, because it provides a sterile environment where you have no reaction, no degradation in helium, and it's inert, noble gas. And also, um, it's used in leak detection, um, welding applications. Um, in liquid form, it's literally the on a rocket that goes up, you have the cargo or people, you have liquid helium around that, that acts as an insulator to absorb all the heat, or the combustibles will send you off into space. Um, and so I'm just going to keep going here. We can go back to this if you'd like. Uh, you know, helium by definition is inert gas, non-flammable, not a fossil fuel. Um, this area where we're at in Los Animas County has an historic helium deposit called Model Dome. Model Dome was a discovery that happened in the 1920s. Uh, there, they just drilled into the Lions Formation Sandstone, which is about 1,200 feet deep at that spot. And they've got natural flow there. Um, the gases that came out of that well was approximately 80% nitrogen, 10% uh, CO2, and the rest helium. And with that, we have a very streamlined process in how we explore for, uh, drill, complete, and produce helium. There is no uh, oil and gas equipment on site to capture any hydrocarbons. Um, it's a very small footprint. We use a very small rig. Um, we use a water well rig. Um, there's no flaring because none of the gas is flammable. Um, we're not proposing any fracking. These are all shallow reservoirs that are approximately 1,000 to 1,500 feet deep. You can kind of get an idea of the, the drill pad size that we use. Uh, we've turned in the waste management plan. Um, you know, we, of course, we uh, cut and fill the topsoil, stockpile that, put a liner down, um, secondary containment um, uh, throughout the operations of the drilling, the well, and the completion. Um, the well spacing, as Joe indicated, we're not seeking any spacing right now, and soon we'll be talking about pipelines. Um, so Los Animas County uh, has an extensive and elevated Precambrian basement. Well, that Precambrian basement is rich in granite and uranium and thorium. Uh, when uranium and thorium goes through radiogenetic decay, it spits out inert gases and noble gases such as helium and other like argon. Well, those gases coalesce in the subsurface until you had a more recent uh, tectonic or uh, geologic event, and that'd be the tertiary age volcanism, like the Spanish peaks and the dikes. You have buried stocks and plutons in the ground. And so those about 20 to 30 million years ago, those inert gases rich in helium that coalesce in the subsurface, 
was brought up to the surface or brought up to tertiary age traps, uh, I'm sorry, Paleozoic age traps like Model Dome and other places we're exploring, similar to the same place from this OGDP and has a good seal. And that is where the helium uh, is captured. And then we produce that. Um, this just kind of gives you a little breakdown showing of the U.S. helium concentrations across the U.S. And it highlights that Los Animas County is one of the most prolific helium uh, areas in the world. Um, the model dome, there's about four wells. Um, there's, these are two of the wells that uh, um, are, we're mentioning. Um, you know, they had the, some of the top helium concentrations in the world. Um, Colorado Helium Resources is a very uh, important opportunity for all of us. Um, during the drilling throughout this Los Animas County region, no hydrocarbons were documented in any of the areas wells that were drilled. This gives you an idea of model dome. It produced for the government for a period of time 500 to 1,000 MCF a day raw gas um, with 8% helium concentration. So we've got a proven helium source a proven reservoir, proven seal. We pride ourselves in, you know, we've been leasing in this area for several years now. We have approximately a third fee, a third state, and a third federal minerals. We have excellent relationship with our mineral and surface owners. We pride ourselves in the community. We're always very communicative. Um, we always try and hit things, you know, as they come up and address any concerns or questions people have. Um, we're proud of our relationships we've established not only with ranchers and mineral and surface owners, but the Nature Conservancy. Um, we have an area that we have got um, uh, surface use agreements in place with both the Nature Conservancy and some of the mineral and surface owners working in collaboration. Um, this is an example of a small footprint join rig. Um, this isn't quite what we're doing in the sense of, uh, it's actually a smaller footprint and there's not this elevated platform here, but it is a rig mounted uh, water well type rig. Um, you can see in our applications, uh, you'll see the expected footprint from our drilling operations and then followed up with that, you'll see our expected footprint with our production operations. But we really minimize our impact. We, uh, you know, um, following the rules, we, you know, cut and stockpile topsoil only in certain areas that we need to dress up for moving in the rig and then put liners down. Um, small footprint, we're doing air drilling. We use minimal water. Um, we will, there's, this is not using any drilling mud. We're drilling with uh, air. In the event we do hit some water during the drilling operations, we have a water tank on site that we add water to the air mixture so that we can get the cuttings to come up. Um, we don't anticipate any water production. Um, we do logging and testing, and the wells are um, temporarily shut in until we get the helium plant in place. Um, the individual wells, you know, we'll have a wellhead that comes up to a two phase separator. Um, one of the uh, outlets of that separator will go to the water tank. Again, we don't anticipate any water production, but in the event of we are prepared for, we have a water tank on location. The other coming out of that two-phase separator is a gas line that goes into the area of um, field gathering gas systems that will eventually go to the helium plant. Um, we're trying to minimize our truck, in, uh, minimize our uh, transportation out there with SCADA systems and so on and so forth. Um, this is an example of a water well rig. You can see it's a very small mast. It's a truck mounted unit. There's the air compressor. I mean, this is really essentially most of the footprint, um, the mechanical footprint. Again, model dome is what we're leaning on. Um, it's been replicated with other wells, historic wells in the area with similar type gases. Again, non-hydrocarbon area. Helium is non-toxic to humans in the environment. It's part of the air that we breathe. We don't anticipate any hydrocarbon gases or liquids. This is a low pressure, high volume reservoir in a shallow setting. Um, these wells are small join rigs, small footprint, no fracking, low density well spacing. Um, and then we of course have got a uh, intern reclamation plan and the final reclamation plan submitted with our proposal. 
And I will turn it over to Andrea, who will better go over the specifics of our OGD piece. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Chair Robbins and Commissioners. My name is Andrea Gross. I am a partner and senior project manager for Upstream Petroleum Management. I have acted as the permit agent for BNL for a little over two years, helping them um, with their permitting efforts as well as citing their locations and analyzing impacts. I'd like to go over a couple of details regarding each of the OGDPs in each location, starting with the state 09 and 16. Like Joe stated earlier, in each OGDP has one vertical helium well in each location. These wells are south of La Junta and east of Trinidad, Colorado in very rural Los Angeles County. BNL has a very good relationship with these surrounding surface owners. However, both of these locations are owned by the state of Colorado and managed by the Colorado State Land Board. Also, as Joe stated, this working on state land board requires us to have an on-site and consultation with the state land board. We went out there with not only the surveyor, a uh, wildlife biologist, and Steve Fries with the Colorado State Land Board. He approved the location, sent the locations to Karen Voltura with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. She reviewed it and approved the locations as well. These locations, as Joe stated, did not require an ALA as they're not within any mapped high priority habitat or not within 2000 feet of any RBU, proximate local government, school, child care facility, or a designated um, outside activity area. The, oops, sorry. You wanna go to the next slide? No, no, I have just a couple more. The state 09 will approximately take um, 3.6 acres for total disturbance. The state 16 will be approximately 3.4 acres of disturbance. However, both will be reclaimed to approximately one acre after interim reclamation. The, these locations have a very small footprint. Peter, move on to the next slide, please. The state 35 and 36 is very similar to the state nine. However, this one will house a couple, some of the production facilities and processing facilities. The state nine and 16, all of the um, product will be transported by a pipeline to an offsite processing plant that will be permitted through CDPHE. So the state 36 will look a little bit different than the nine, 16 and 35 in that it did house some production and processing equipment. Next slide, Peter. I'd like to um, focus a little bit on wildlife. As we stated before, there are no residential building units, schools, or childcare facilities, and this is in rural Los Angeles. With that being said, wildlife is our um, most significant receptor to impacts. All four locations are outside mapped high priority habitat. Again, they are re um, reviewed and approved by CPW. Within that CPW um, consultation, they identified three species that um, could be of concern to them in the area. It was the burrowing owl, mountain plover, and swift fox. BNL hired an independent wildlife biologist to perform a site visit as well as a desktop wildlife review. He determined that all four locations were not suitable habitat for any of the three species and would not be of a concern. However, we did approve or commit to a BOP or BMP stating that BNL will perform a pre-disturbance survey to confirm that these three species are still not present. If they are present, we will abide by some timing stipulations. All those timing stipulations end um, on or around August 31st at this time. Um, Joe Pershala kind of hit on all the other permitting aspects. These, these locations are all very similar to each other. And with that, um, I'll switch it back over to Peter for a couple of additional slides. Thank you, Andrea. 
And just going over, um, just giving you a better look at the reservoir that we're going after. This is a map that shows the thickness of the Lions Reservoir, and it also shows the structural closures that are expected in this area. Um, these four wells, you can see where they are, the 9, 16, 35, and 36. You can see the area's existing wells. This cross section here kind of goes from the northwest to the southeast, and this just shows the Lions Reservoir. Um, this is a reservoir that's a uh, highly permeable porous zone. It's it's uh, not a water uh, well or not, not an aquifer that's used in the area. Um, it's a, it's brine water, um, and this just shows uh, what our potential looks like out there. Um, this is another geologic detection showing kind of the some of the nuances of the geology out there showing our our prospect area, the, the structure, and the potential faulting that we've documented. These Benton B1s and Colorado B1s, there was no flow rates done in those wells. Um, there was no uh, helium capture in those wells, but they look like they should have helium and good flow rates, and we're excited to go out there and drill some wells. That concludes our very short presentation. Um, myself and Andrew be the primary contacts, and we welcome any questions or discussion that we may have from here. Okay, great. Um, if we could stop the screen share. Yeah, I'm working on that, sir. Uh, okay, thanks. Apologize about that. There we go. Now I can see everybody. It's helpful to determine who has questions by being able to see folks. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, we will now turn to Commissioner Questions. Uh, which Commissioner would like to go first with questions? Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks for the presentation. And it's always good to get a little geology lesson for those of us who don't have it in our background, just to remind us how this all works. Um, I, I am curious, and this isn't necessarily related to your application, but if, if this reservoir is going to be kind of like a place of a lot of future activity and whether or not you, if so, you all have considered coming back in the future with a kind of a cap application. So we're not doing two here, two there, two here, two there, but kind of like an overall plan that you might have. and letting us view it all at the same time? And I, you might not have an answer to that, but I was just curious. No, that's a very interesting point. Um, we have several OGDPs, some of which are in the same area as this one here, these two here, and it may be more efficient for us to uh, present them all at once, but that's not how we've been doing it or directed. So we've got a series of OGDPs that we're gonna be going through with you over the next couple months. Um, maybe that cap setting would be something we should look into. Um, thank you for the suggestion. Well, and if staff has told you not to, listen to them. <laughs> but okay. I was just thinking it might help us get a better picture of everything that you're trying to do and review it all at the same time. But thank you, I appreciate the response. Commissioner yes, McGowan, I'd like to add a little bit of context to that. Um, we have considered a cap and you may look into that. Um, staff has not directed us to a cap at this point. We, like Peter said, we're, we're trying to group some of the locations that share unique um, characteristics or they're gonna be sharing a pipeline. And we're trying to group those in. So it's, it's almost like a little mini cap so you can see the true cumulative impacts and aspects to a grouping of them. So like I said, we're, we're not opposed and we may consider a cap or, or speak with staff in the future. Thank you for that. Further questions? Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Mr. Purcello was correct. This is my first uh, helium project as a commissioner and, and appreciate the uh, background, Mr. Kondrat and Ms. Gross uh, for our benefit. Thank you. I, I think I heard you say, and I think this is just really an educational question for me, but I think I heard you say that of the gases that are produced, 80% is nitrogen and 10% is uh, carbon dioxide, I believe, leaving a, a small portion of helium. What, what's done with those um, products? 
Um, the raw gas is entered into a pipeline system, and then it goes into a helium plant. There are several helium plants across the USA, and what typically happens is those gases are go through a series of pressuring absorption chambers, and in that process, the helium is purified to higher, it's processed to higher purities, and the nitrogen is vented to the atmosphere, and some of the CO2 is vented to the atmosphere if it meets the emission standards, or it's captured in the carbon sequestering beds. Thank you. And again, for my information, is there is there any control on the emission of nitrogen to the atmosphere? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. It's nitrogen's part of our the air that we breathe. Right. It's a non-toxic, non-flammable, um, no harm to humans or the environment that I'm aware of. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate those answers. I also uh, sent a question before re related to the nature of, of erecting fences that was a little unclear to me in the application and just uh, received the response back that if you do erect fences around these sites that you'll coordinate with the State Land Board and CPW to ensure that the uh, proper fence is erected and I appreciate that. Thank you. Nothing further, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you for the response. Any further questions with commissioners? All right, seeing no further questions, uh, we move to deliberations. Does anyone want to initiate deliberations? Commissioner Messner? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, understanding that we've got two different docket numbers here, um, I'll start with the first one, but um, I would move approval of docket number 22010011, which is uh, um, the, the 9 and 16 OGDP. I have a motion. Do we have a second? second? A motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Commissioner Ackerman? Sorry for the late comment there, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to recognize um, the importance of the operator uh, coordinating with CPW and addressing all the wildlife concerns that were potential on site even though they were deemed to be not necessarily significant, they still put appropriate protocols in place. And I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Yes, very good. Seeing no further discussion, we have a motion to approve this docket with a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, docket 2201-00011 is approved. We now would look for a motion on docket 22010005. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you to the applicant and to staff for the OGDPs, and they have been approved. Thank you. Thank we you really appreciate the opportunity and, and all the staff's help. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is an executive session. Um, would look to either AAG Mercer or AAG Davenport for next steps in terms of moving to executive session. Lauren, you're muted. Thank you. Um, sorry about that, Mr. Chair. I was um, just going to say that our next steps would be, um, I'll read the, the script to send us into executive session. Um, and then the commissioners and AAG Davenport and I will convene in a separate Zoom, um, conduct executive session, and then come back to this um, meeting once that's been concluded. Um, so if I may, I'll um, kick us off. Uh, pursuant to the open meetings law, the commission is entitled to enter into executive session at this regular meeting to receive legal advice pursuant to Colorado revised statutes section 2464023A2. The topic of the executive session was identified on the agenda for this meeting, and that is the consideration of the proposed settlement of case number 2021CB33518. Petron Development Company versus COGCC. 
Um, so Mr. Chair, I invite you to encourage a motion to enter into executive session for the matters and purposes I just named. So encouraged. So moved. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to enter into executive session as uh, established by A.G. Mercer. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Did I hear other ayes? Aye. Okay. All those uh, against going into executive session? Seeing none, um, we now will leave this meeting, go into our executive session. This probably will take about 30 minutes or so. We will come back to this meeting um, when we are done with the executive session. All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, AAG Mercer, I believe we call on you first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We are returning from executive session. During executive session, the commission received legal advice regarding the proposed settlement in the Petron versus COGCC case. Um, no decisions were made and no votes were taken. So Chairman Robbins, I would invite you to encourage a motion to exit executive session. So encouraged. So moved. Motion and a second to leave executive session. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are no longer in executive session. At this point, I believe we will take up the next matter on our agenda, which is consideration of the proposed settlement of 2021 CV 33518 Petron Development Company versus COGCC. Is there any discussion or does any commissioner desire to make a motion? I'll move approval of the settlement. I'll second. Motion and a second. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That comes to the conclusion of the matters that were on our agenda. Does any commissioner have anything further for the good of the cause? Seeing none, I uh, would encourage a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.